Innovation. The process of making changes to something by introducing something better, and as a consequence, something new. Here on My Next Appliance, we try to focus on innovation everywhere, and in the Gaming War series, we look at a device that for many of us was our introduction into the digital world. The series will eventually end with the current console leaders, Nintendo, Microsoft, and Sony, as well as the state of mobile, computer, and platform gaming. This episode is about the sixth generation of consoles, which is what I think was the most innovative generation of consoles ever produced. For the first time, video game consoles could be used for more than just playing games. Wait a minute, which is the best gaming platform? Well, let's take a look. During this generation, Managing platforms was a priority because it kept game developers and gamers engaged. At the end of the last episode, we were left with a two-horse race between Sony and Nintendo, while Sega was busy trying to repair its brand. Then Sega introduced the Dreamcast. Launching the sixth generation console wars with a bang. First, it helped repair relations with retailers, found a partner in Microsoft to help develop its operating system on the DirectX gaming platform, and it was the first console offering internet gaming and web browsing. On the hardware side, it had both a PowerVR GPU and a visual memory unit in the controller, giving you game information and stats. And to top it off, it had the most awesome launch titles. The Dreamcast sold out in record numbers within the first 24 hours of its launch. But Sega was actually too weak to compete. What? What do you mean too weak? You see, in the last generation of consoles, Sony dominated because the PlayStation 1 was a loss leader device. The company sold the console at a loss and made up for it with software sales later on. During the sixth generation console wars, Sega was so weak that it only had a little bit of cash to survive. Sony fired back by leaking the PS2 eight months before the Dreamcast launch in North America. So, how did the PS2 launch go down? Demand was unprecedented, with units selling on eBay for over a thousand dollars. The PS2 could play video games... and DVD movies in a single device, and it cost the same as DVD players at the time. The problem for Sega was the business was just too weak and too messed up to survive. The Sega America CEO was actually fired right before the Dreamcast launch. You're fired. So only Sony and Nintendo had enough cash to keep on fighting. Then out comes the GameCube. It was designed by Nintendo with third-party developers in mind. It was both easier to program and finally did away with cartridges using the cheaper optical discs. But unlike Sony, the Nintendo strategy was to make a profit on hardware and also focus on family-friendly games. And with legendary game designers like Shigeru Miyamoto, Nintendo made proportionally way more money from its own first-party games. To this day, the biggest reason to buy a Nintendo console is to play its epic franchises. Hmm.
While Sony had several big franchises under its belt, most of the gaming innovation came from third-party developers. Wait a second. Isn't this about the Xbox? You see, at the time, Microsoft focused mostly on software. They had a partnership with Sega, they developed their own games, but when the VP of game publishing saw what the engineers were working on, he liked it. So after Sega launched the Dreamcast, Bill Gates leaked that Microsoft was working on its own gaming and multimedia platform. He personally unveiled the Xbox when the Dreamcast was starting to collapse and the PS2 was just ramping up in Japan. Uh, for the first time, let me now unveil Xbox. This console, more than any other at the time, represented the future. It had great launch titles, the financial backing of Microsoft, and a strong third-party game developer community carried over from the Dreamcast and PC games. But for most gamers, the best feature was Xbox Live, reaching almost 2 million subscribers by 2005. <laughs> Xbox used subscription fees to build a centralized network with their own servers so that game developers could focus on making games. It was the first console with a built-in hard disk drive and the first console by a US company since Atari's Jaguar. And Microsoft didn't forget about gaming content. They cleverly bought Bungie Studios right before the Xbox launch and Rare Studios a short time later to beef up in-house game development. So why wasn't the Nintendo GameCube more popular? I love that thing. Even though it had great hardware that was finally easier to program on, the appeal of its platform was shrinking among hardcore gamers. When the recession hit, all the video game consoles propped up their platforms with a bloody price war. And even though Nintendo dropped its console price to $99, it just wasn't enough to regain its past glory. The market had changed. But a few great games kept Nintendo afloat. But in the end, the Xbox passed the Nintendo to take second place in North America, and ultimately sold 10% more consoles than Nintendo. So at the end of the sixth generation era, Sega went from building consoles to becoming a software game developer. Sony, in the meantime, joined Toshiba and IBM to focus on hardware. They were researching a custom processor that would marry the power of a desktop with the performance of a GPU for its upcoming PS3. But in the background, Microsoft figured out how to steal this processor and put it in the Xbox 360. So while Sony and Microsoft were fighting over hardware, Nintendo was trying to figure out how to turn its console into something that appealed to non-gamers. But we'll have to save that for the next episode. Stay tuned as we continue the series all the way up to the current eighth generation of consoles with some fresh information about a new competitor in the hardware business. For the best prices for video game stuff, please support the channel by clicking the Amazon links below and saving any good deals to your cart. Thank you everyone for your patience and for your feedback in every video, and hit that like button if you approve this episode. If you're a new viewer, please like, comment, share, and subscribe with email notifications to join this new channel where we try to focus on innovation everywhere and the companies behind it. You can also follow me on Twitter for news and good tech deals.